All right, biologists, this is conservation of biodiversity, subtopic A4.2, the last video of theme A, unity and diversity. Now, biodiversity as the variety of life in all its forms, levels, and combinations. So biodiversity does not depend only on the different species that exist. Biodiversity occurs in many levels. The first being genetic biodiversity. What does that mean? Look at these giraffes. This guy's not a giraffe. This guy's an okapi. But look at this one. This one is a little bit more red. This one is a little darker. This one is lighter with a smaller pattern. This one has an intricate pattern. They are all different. And this variety of individuals within a species that gives genetic biodiversity. If everyone is the same, everyone is a clone, then there's no biodiversity in that sense. The other aspect is species biodiversity. Now this, this is about the different species in an ecosystem, right? Let's look here at this, a bit of a wacky ecosystem with lion and tiger. There's a kangaroo there, anteater, jaguar. Let's imagine they all live in the same place. They belong to the same ecosystem. Then you would have here the different species composing the species biodiversity of that ecosystem. And then finally, we have this ecosystem diversity diversity, different ecosystems that exist in a given area. So look at this map here. In this place, we have Atlantic rainforest, seasonal forest, steppe. We have different types of ecosystems going on here in this area, creating the ecosystem diversity of that area. Comparisons between current number of species on Earth and past levels of biodiversity. So the fossil record shows that the number of species alive today is greater than ever. How would we know that? We would look at the fossil record. So imagine this. These are layers of sedimentary rock. Now, the bottom, the bottom layers are older than the top layers. Think of your bedroom, the mess in your bedroom, the things at the bottom of that mess are there for longer, and the layers on top are more recent. Same here with fossils. So we can estimate the biodiversity by looking at the fossils. And what does this red line represent? A mass extinction event. Look at that. We have all this diversity of fossils and some of them, but not all, survived this event. And this is how we can estimate the biodiversity and the biodiversity loss of extinction events. Now, we got to keep in mind the fossil record is incomplete. The rule is organisms die and they are decomposed by saprotrophs instead of becoming fossils. So we got to keep that in mind. However, given the data we have, we can estimate that the current number of species is now greater than ever before. We also estimate that 86% of species are yet to be discovered. We are going to see later how we estimate biodiversity so that people can come up with numbers like that. Now, there's something here, this lumpers and splitters. All right, these arrows here, first of all, these arrows here, they represent extinction events, right? The mass extinctions. The one that killed the dinosaurs, right there. So he, here we have biodiversity before and biodiversity after, right? Here we have the number of species, so biodiversity in terms of species biodiversity and time. So whenever you have a drop in number of species, you have a mass extinction. And what do we mean here by lumpers and splitters? Here are the lumpers are the people who would classify many similar life forms, similar fossils into the same species. Not necessarily fossils, but fossils as well. And here the splitters are the ones who are trying to name as many species as possible. So any minor, any minute difference, that would constitute a different species. So they would look at a group. The lumpers would say, well, this, all of those, and all of those, and all of those, they all belong to the same species. Splitters would be like, yeah, but this one is slightly different from this one, and they're slightly different from that one. So... They should be classified as three different species. When you're talking about fossils, the biological concept of species does not apply because you cannot know if these different groups can interbreed and produce fossil, uh, sorry, produce fertile offspring. So this is up to debate and sometimes given new evidence, reclassification can occur.
Now, causes of anthropogenic species extinction. You keep an eye here on the meme. These will be the causes of anthropogenic species extinction and crisis in biodiversity. Whenever you have to blame something, this is it. Overharvesting resources, habitat destruction, pollution, global climate change, and invasive species. Over harvesting, you may remove a given resource, and that resource could be a plant resource, could be an animal resource, and in the end, you can drive a species to extinction by over hunting, over fishing. You can destroy the habitat for that species, expansion of agriculture, urbanization, deforestation in general, pollution, of course, including ocean acidification, which is a major threat to corals, global climate change will cause habitats to change. Abiotic factors that support certain species might change and not support those species anymore. And of course, invasive species. Invasive species is a species that are, is not native to a certain area, but was introduced and now they're creating disequilibrium. They're over competing, out competing the native species. They're hunting the native species. So that is a big no-no. All right, the examples that IB asks you to know. MOAS, do you need to know the scientific name of MOAS? No, you do not. But if you want to write it, here it is. Just don't forget to underline the name. But you can call them MOAS and that will be absolutely fine. MOAS are these birds. They are flightless birds. That means they cannot fly. They're just there running being massive dinosaurs, and they were extincted around the 15th century. And guess what? We were the invasive species. We arrived, we overhunt, so we destroyed them for meat more than they could reproduce. We drove them to extinction. This was a long time ago. There are no records of moas living anymore. Maybe also wants you to know the Caribbean monk seals. And this is what's much more recent, 1952. My grandparents were alive when Caribbean monk seals still existed. We have photographs. This is in a zoo. And the cause of extinction were, again, overhunting. People would hunt them for oil from their blubber. And we would outcompete them for fish, so the ones who are not killed directly would just die from hunger. So eventually, they died in 1952, never to be seen again. Now, this is slightly different because we're talking about ecosystem loss, loss of an entire ecosystem. And the example is the dipterocarp forest in Southeast Asia. Now, the thing is, dipterocarps are this massive trees here. They are a keystone species. What does that mean? It means they support other life forms. In general, the greater the biodiversity, the more resilient the system is. That means it resists better to changes, to disturbances. The problem is the ecosystem relies on the dipterocarps. So if you remove the dipterocarps, the whole house of cards falls apart. Now, this was a highly diverse system. Look at that. These are the seeds of the pterocarps. They had these wings. It's so cool. Look at that. This is a map of the ecosystem loss. And why are, uh, is the ecosystem being lost? Because of logging, for example. They are, these trees are being overexploited. We are removing these trees for wood resource, for timber, but also deforestation for oil palm plantation. We remove, we clear the forest so we can plant palm for palm oil. That carries the extra consequence of peat decomposition. And peat decomposes and releases greenhouse gases. So on top of losing an entire ecosystem, we are also releasing greenhouse gases. This map will show the current land before the use change, before replacing the forest for oil palm plantation. And now we have these areas here that are protected. And you see the scale of richness. Richness just means number of species. And we see that the protected areas here, here, they keep their richness. They keep the number of species. 
and basically everywhere else, where are the species? What's going on? Look at that. Look how green you had it here and nothing in. You had this yellow rich area and what's left. So you can see that these protected areas serve as biodiversity reserves, right? And beside that map, what kind of evidence do we have for a biodiversity crisis? First of all, we need reliable evidence that must be verifiable. You cannot make claims that you cannot verify. That's a staple of scientific knowledge. Claims must be reliable and verifiable. Therefore, you need clear methodology and data that can be checked. If you cannot check, then you cannot consider this data, which takes us to scientists versus citizen scientists. Citizen scientists is just like anyone, just any person that can collect data through some app or a website and contribute to data collection, which is great because the data collection, data collecting power of a large number of people is much greater than just a few professional scientists. On the other hand, since you cannot really verify this information, you always have to take that with a grain of salt and hence your claims might not be as reliable as the ones based on data and methodology that were done by professional scientists and checked by other scientists. The two most important institutions here in this theme are the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystems that collects official data from several countries, and the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, which publishes the very famous red list, red list for species and red list for ecosystems. That's where you get information about a species, if the species is vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered. It all comes from the IUCN's red list. And here we have one of the many forms of Simpson's Biodiversity Index. This is a way to calculate biodiversity in a given area. And we're back here with the causes of current biodiversity crisis. And just like the meme from a while ago, overexploitation, loss of habitat because of urbanization, agricultural land use, pollution, invasive and alien species, all that will be the causes of the current biodiversity crisis. Now, IB says, I should tell you that population growth increases the pressure on ecosystems and to a degree, that is true. However, not all populations put the same pressure on the ecosystem and not every individual in a certain population puts the same pressure on the ecosystem. And if you think about it, businesses, including agribusinesses, put a much greater pressure on ecosystems than individuals. So yes, if on one hand, the more people there is on a planet, the greater the pressure for resources and land, etc., will be. On the other hand, lifestyle plays a major role and we cannot forget that consumption is what really puts pressure on the system. Now, how do we conserve biodiversity? Remember from the previous map with the dipterocarp forest, you had preserved areas that would preserve the species. Well, that's one of the in situ conservation methods that include wildlife reserves or the reintroduction of species that was extincted, the species that were extincted in a certain area, you reintroduce them from a different area and reestablish the ecosystem or even the removal of invasive species from that area will help preserve biodiversity in situ. That means in the place. But we also have ex situ methods out of the place. That will include botanical gardens like this one in my hometown, seed banks and zoological gardens. The zoo is important for conservation of biodiversity. The zoo is not a place or locking animals up and treat them with disregard and uh, torture and things like that. Yes, there are some zoos that are less than ideal. I would say there are so many zoos that are less than ideal. 
for lack of funding. But zoos rescue animals that were being traded illegally. They rehabilitate animals. They preserve species. They promote reproduction in captivity. Zoos are actually very important in preserving biodiversity. Zoos even provide the individuals for the uh, reintroduction of species. They have to come from somewhere. Sometimes they come from in. Um, Sometimes they come from reproduction in captivity in zoos. So zoo is an important thing. And finally, the selection of evolutionarily distinct and globally endangered species for conservation prior priority prioritization. Oh my God. In the edge of existing program. Edge come from evolutionarily distinct and globally endangered edge evolutionarily distinct means it's related to few or no other species like this guy here look how it belongs to a clade of its own not closely related to others like b and c are b and c are closely related here and there are others it's not to say that the species b or species c are not important but A is so much different from everything else that if it, it goes extinct, there's nothing similar to A anymore. So it takes some priority. Globally endangered comes from the IUCN red list that we just talked about. So it will depend on their conservation status. Of course, if they're extinct, there's nothing we can do. It's about the edge of existence and not beyond existence. But the closer they are to the edge of existence, the closer they are to being extinct, the higher their priority will be. Because if you don't do something now, they might go extinct. So least concern are species that we don't have to worry about their extinction. Dogs, we don't have to worry about the extinction of dogs. That's not going to happen. Now, endangered or vulnerable or even critically endangered, we got to act now, we got to do something. And if these species are endangered and they are distinct, they qualify for the edge of existence program. These are the top five here at the bottom. These are the top five species, uh, the top five priorities in the edge of existence program. There are many others, but this is just for illustration. You do not have to know their names or anything like that. So that's it, biologists. With that, we finish the standard level content for theme A. The next video, we start talking about carbohydrates and lipids in B1.1. Don't forget to like and subscribe.